many athletes begin with a, a goal. And uh, let's just make it up. I want to finish an Ironman for the first time or I want to win the world championships. It doesn't matter what the goal is, but it's this very sort of stake in the ground goal. And goals are great. But the real value that you get from going on a quest to achieve a goal is the actual journey itself. And, and an athletic journey of when you start today and in a year's time you want to finish an Ironman, just using that as a small case study, the real benefit, all of the joy, lessons, growth, how to navigate failure and adversity, that all comes out of that multi-month, multi-year journey that you're going on that's not going to be linear in progression. It's going to include setbacks and failures, et cetera, et cetera. But that is the crucible. That's the goodness. The destination, the race, if we're, if we're using that as a, as a case study, it's just the cherry. And in fact, ironically, bizarrely, it doesn't even really matter whether you're successful in the goal or not. If you are going on this quest and journey of self-improvement, discovery, commitment, you're going to draw so much benefit and it diffuses the pass fail of the goal at the end of the day. And that's why we always focus on the journey so much and we focus on self-improvement rather than, look, it's great. Athletes win world championships, athletes qualify to Hawaii. We celebrate all of that. Athletes cross the finish line of an Ironman. But the real benefit is how the journey fits in and amplifies life. Welcome to the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. We are Jess and BJ, and each week we share stories of people looking, finding, and living their purpose. Although we may desire to find our purpose without too much failure and discomfort, the truth is, is that many of us who are living what we came here to do is because of failure and discomfort. As athletes, we know about resistance and struggles and walls that appear too steep to climb. But as athletes, we also know that who we have grown into today is because of those challenges. Our guest for this episode is Matt Dixon, a world-class triathlon coach with a background as an elite swimmer and exercise physiologist. Matt is a former professional triathlete who is all too familiar with the highs and lows of athleticism. I have heard him describe himself as the example of a professional career done very poorly, a heavy admittance that he has since used to his advantage to learn and grow. Matt has evolved into one of the most sought-after coaches in the world who has seen great success in applying his methodology to guide athletes to the very top of triathlon. Matt is the founder of Purple Patch Fitness, which is an international community of coaches and athletes. He is the host of the Purple Patch podcast and author of The Well-Built Triathlete and Fast Track Triathlete. We're excited to dive in with this coach because although his focus may appear to be athletic potential, it is ultimately about reaching human potential, which we believe we are all meant to realize in this life. Matt, thank you so much for being here and welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I'm a, I'm a little humbled. Uh, that, that that almost made me sound impressive, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you are quite impressive, and you know, it's. I think when we are able to look back at our life and see all the rough and tumble pieces of it, and the successes as well as what we coin failures, and use all of that as you know this stew to be better, to rise above, and to lead others you know, you really are quite impressive. And I think that, um, you know, that's one of the reasons we have you here is we want to share that with people, that this message of, you know, being vulnerable with our stories, there's nothing to hide, um, you know, uh, releasing fear that we will be judged and seeing what we can truly become because of those challenges in our life. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I think the the timing of the last uh, year and a half or so, I guess, year plus of um, of the adversity that we've all and the stress that we've all faced one way or another, and, and it's been expressed in different ways, is is a great case study of performance, ultimately. And, um, you know, if I go back through with, from an athletic lens, when when we go back a year ago, uh, now about a year ago, when this thing really started to take its grip on us, it, it, it was 
very, very quickly that we started to try to shift the lens from adversity to opportunity. And, uh, and I think that's in an athlete's DNA. So often I think it's in a coach's DNA of what can we learn? How can we grow? How can we adapt? And so I feel like our conversation today is, is timely and appropriate because we've just lived, all lived, held hands and all lived through a journey that is, uh, has been tough and it has been challenging and we're not out of it yet. But I think coming out of it, there is an opportunity for, for everyone to, uh, to what we like to say, emerge stronger in many ways. So where, where in your story, um, just to give our audience a little, a little snapshot of who you are, um, in your story, how did you, um, how did you come to face adversity and then become, uh, the coach and, uh, uh, entrepreneur you are today yeah we could I th it's my favorite subject me but uh no <laughs> <laughs> we love you uh, yeah <laughs> adversity i grew up in east london i tell you that's adversity in itself but uh <laughs> uh yeah no I, I was very very lucky look i had a, a very nice uh childhood and um and i had the opportunity when i was 18 to come to the u.s on a swimming scholarship and at the time, I was swimming at a pretty high level. I'd uh, qualified to the finals of the Olympic trials. And my quest of coming to the US, the best swimming country in the world, was to make the 96 team. And, uh, and I got to come to this great country, got my university uh, supported, and had four years to come out of it with an education and, uh, and also uh, have a quest to go make the Olympic team, which I did not uh, go and mate. And the truth is that I think that I had a great work ethic, but I was just on that outer funnel of talent level where you're, you're trying to get to that, that across the finish line. I was just on the other side of the fence, basically. But, um, but my educational background was exercise physiology, clinical physiology, to be exact. And, uh, and when I finished swimming, I started coaching swimming. And, uh, and it was while I was coaching swimming that I found this sport of triathlon. I thought, here's another chance for an elite career. Let's, uh, let's go and give it a crack. And after about a year, I, I turned professional. And as Jess mentioned earlier, I think I'm a great example of how to do a professional career really poorly. And, and the reason for that, now back in the late 90s and early 2000s, the, the whole approach to sport, endurance sports at that time, was all about the tough man wins, the accumulation of work, and things that are so obviously important nowadays were just completely disregarded or sign, saw, seen as a sign of weakness or just given lip service and, and uh, aspects like how we eat and the role of strength training and um, recovery. And I ignored all of those and uh, with the help of some very poor coaching, drove myself into the ground and ended up with, with extreme physical burnout, chronic fatigue, whatever you'd like to call it. And, and that ironically was the best thing that ever happened to me because it was the great proverbial slap in the face. Here was someone that had already a career in swimming, a background, a master's degree in clinical physiology, a background in coaching, and obviously a pretty slow learner because I took that into professional sport and drove myself into the ground. And so very, very briefly to cut the, the story short, that was the thing that forced me to look at the landscape of the sport and think there's got to be a better way. And out of that, both at the professional level and at the amateur level, I decided that when I was really going to take on coaching of triathletes, I was going to adopt a different philosophy, one that was against the grain, one that I got a lot of criticism for at the time, which was on an equal playing field, yes, you have to work hard to do well at sport, swim, bike and run for triathletes, but I was going to put on an equal playing field strength, the big sort of habits around nutrition and hydration, and then the thing that I really focused on, recovery. And that was really the catalyst for me starting my coaching career and I think um, having a lot of the success across genders, across levels of athlete that, that has now sort of become purple patch in many ways. Mm. You used a phrase that um, we encourage 
so many people who have, you know, a spark within them or something that they want to follow their heart on that perhaps may not make sense on paper, and that is to live against the grain. Mm -hmm. um, BJ and I have lived that, uh, especially at the beginning, you know, when there's no momentum and, and you just feel like you're <laughs> living against the grain and swimming upstream and there's nobody swimming with you. In those times, did you experience any, you know, self-doubt or, um, you know, how did you keep going? I don't know if you remember a time where you were like, whoa, what am I doing? Or were you just so, were your feet so rooted in the ground and were you so clear about the direction that you needed to go that that superseded self-doubt? No, I had massive self-doubt. In fact, I had... Uh, uh, coming from England was important for me because the one of the things, it's changed a little bit, but when I grew up, nobody started a business. It was still a class system and, and, and to some extent still is. And so I didn't feel like I had any business starting my own business. And in fact, it was my wife, Kelly, who really was the catalyst to give me the confidence to do that. What I had that that drove me was a real deep sense of purpose. I was almost writing a wrong. It was a, a personal sort of journey of, wow, I really messed it up myself. And then when I looked at others, I saw other people, maybe to a less extreme, but I saw a whole bunch of people fit and fatigued, not getting the return of investment in their hard work, both at the professional level and particularly for people that were trying to integrate sport into these really crazy, busy life that we live. So I had a lot of support and a lot of encouragement through the lack of belief or confidence or almost the right to who am I to start a business. But what I had driving was Kelly supporting me and, and, and a host of other friends as well. And, and then on top of it, this deep sense of righting a wrong. And I'll, I'll never forget, we, we went to a race and this was just when I decided I was going to start Purple Patch, so t late 2007. And we were flying back, we're on United Airlines, way back in seat whatever, 38J. And I, I wish I still had the napkin. It would be on our center that I'm sitting in right now. It would be framed. Unfortunately, we lost it. But Kelly wrote down or, or took out the napkin, took out a pen and said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to change the way endurance sports are coached. That's what I wrote down. Now, that sounds very egotistical. It sounds very grandiose. But I think that just shows the sense of purpose that drove. And if you have a sense of purpose, the how comes out of that. And when it gets tough, because I started to write a lot in the publications and I started to write a lot about stress and management of stress, a lot about recovery. And very, very quickly, many other coaches and um, quote experts in field dismissed me as a quack, a mm -hmm. snake oil salesman, someone that was selling quick fixes. And of course, what was, what I felt so affronted with is that they're not listening. They're not, they're, they're, they're taking the message and they're taking 10 steps to the side and saying that I'm offering a quick fix or saying you don't have to work hard. It's like, no, you've got to work hard. It's a tough sport, but you've got to work effective. And, and it took a long time. I, I'm talking multiple years of staying on task, on purpose and not getting distracted and, and I was very lucky because I, I got to work with some pretty good athletes pretty early. And when they start having good success, then people start to notice. And I think the catalyst of boom, belief and recognition and maybe uh, uh, the people starting to think maybe it's not a quick fix was, uh, was when Chris Lieta got second at the Hawaii Ironman and... You know, he was already world class. We changed everything with his approach to nutrition, recovery. You know, he was doing a third less of the training hours and boom, he had this explosion. But then we started to have f developing female athletes from amateur to pro, male athletes, it, you know, long-term development projects. And 
it, and the message started to become understood. And the last thing I will say that was really lucky is the sport was ready to change. So while I was one of the voices, I, I wasn't the voice and, and I would never have claimed to have actually done that. I know I had a small contribution, but we were all getting smarter. And so I was really lucky <laughs> that the timing was there that people wanted to ultimately listen. And, and I think that some of my success and Purple Patch success has been the luck of timing, the luck of who we've connected with, um, coupled with the tremendous hard work and the deep sense of purpose. And, you know, your, your courage to act on it, right? You had this deep sense of, of purpose, but, but you still had to, you know, act with bravery. You know, I'm sure that there was times that you were scared. There's a, um, there's a, it's just coming into my awareness. Um, Elizabeth Gilbert wrote a great book called Big Magic, and it's all about, um, you know, living with bravery and, and, you know, how many times that, you know, she never got replies about her book ideas and things like that. And she talks about this book that she got the inspiration to write, and it was very, very, very specific plot line, all of this, and she never wrote it. Years mm -hmm. later, she's having lunch with a woman that is, you know, one of her uh, mentors in writing, somebody she really looks up to. And the woman says to her, I just finished writing this book. And so Elizabeth says, well, what's the book? And she tells her, I mean, character by character, plot line, the whole book that she was inspired to write, but never wrote it. And so the lesson there is like, okay, like the world of triathlon was ready. Endurance sports was ready for this. Had you not acted on it, they say, you know, like it would have gone to somebody else. So it's, I think it's so important that when we have these feelings, even if it's against the grain, even if we have self-doubt, even if people are saying like, these guys don't, I, we have no interest in what they're saying or they're quacks or they're this or they're that, that you keep going anyway. You keep going back to that sense of purpose. Well, in, in some ways, uh, in some ways when I, when I look back, the way that I would, from when I was very young, and, and we are all in some ways influenced heavily or products of our experiences growing up. And I mentioned that I, I grew up in Britain. It was very much a sort of track to come out of school, go and get a job, et cetera. And I saw, you know, when you're at an airport and there's a, a sort of escalator, but a walking, a moving walkway. And uh, when I was younger, when I was 16, 17, 18, and I had this chance to come to America, I'd never been here. It was pre-internet. I didn't know the difference between Kansas and New York and LA. I was just coming to this country. <laughs> and, and there's a whole story there that I want to tell you, but it was completely <laughs> oblivious about this place. But the way, it, the way that I looked at it was that I was moving through life on this travelator, or whatever you want to call it, and experiences and opportunities are going to come. And if I don't reach out and grab it, it's, good, it's going to be gone. And I think that that was a huge thing that at 18, I, I came and, you know, I couldn't just email my family. I didn't have any money. So I'd call back once a month. It was, I mean, younger listeners would be serious. It's like, no, I, I just like basically <laughs> left my family and friends behind. But that is an experience of big growth, big challenge. And... Um, and, and, and it shifts your lens. And so when I got over the hump with Kelly's help to start Purple Patch, I then felt like once I'd taken that step, it was almost like I'd come out behind the curtain and I'm standing on stage and I'm like, shit, I'm out here now, I've got to do it. And so fear dissipates because if I'm going to be out there, I, better, I might as well give it my best effort to dance and sing. And And so... I think that there's a, uh, a, a sense from whenever anyone's trying to do something like this that the person that is in the leadership position is just really confident, knows what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole journey of, I just got to learn. I've got to work it out. I'm not going to know anything. I've just got to jump off the cliff and see if I can flap my arms fast enough to fly. And once you get there... It's just about solving problems. And now it's autopilot. But I'm, what I realize now is that everything that I thought I knew, I keep learning more and it, it just you carry on the journey. And so, uh, so yeah, I think that the, 
the the growth never stops, the learning never stops. You just get more secure in who you are and what's important in many ways. But there's always fear. Yeah, there's, well, there's, <laughs> there's always, always fear. It wants to hold us back and keep us safe. And and what you're talking about right there is that beginner's mindset, something um, we really embraced in our uh, yoga teacher training was that we're always learning, right? We're never going to be the expert. If, once we're the expert, we've stopped We've stopped growing because we we know it all, um, and there's those self-proclaimed experts out there, and and it's a catchy phrase. But I really like being a beginner. I really like putting ourselves in that environment of experiencing. So, you know, when you were writing those articles, you were talking about. I'm sure many of those articles were from your own experience of how you managed um, your way through it. In, in the athletes that you coach, you know, the professionals, but also this amazing um, amateur team that you have uh, developed over the, over the past few years or maybe even recently, um, do you see that trickle-down effect from your ability to, to guide and to manage um, and to be fearless at times to your, um, to your coaches and then on to your athletes? I, I think so. Uh, and, and the way that I'll answer it, is is like this it it all begins with the the spirit of how you start a journey so we talk a lot whether we're talking to our athletes whether i'm talking to our coaching team uh the broader purple patch team that many athletes begin with a a goal and uh, let's just make it up. I want to finish an Ironman for the first time, or I want to win the world championships. It doesn't matter what the goal is, but it's this very sort of stake in the ground goal. And goals are great. But the real value that you get from going on a quest to achieve a goal is the actual journey itself. And, and an athletic journey of when you start today and in a year's time, you want to finish an Ironman, just using that as a small case study, the real benefit, all of the joy, lessons, growth, how to navigate failure and adversity, that all comes out of that multi-month, multi-year journey that you're going on that's not going to be linear in progression. It's going to include setbacks and failures, et cetera, et cetera. But that is the crucible. That's the goodness the destination, the race, if we're, if we're using that as a, as a case study, is just the cherry. And in fact, ironically, bizarrely, it doesn't even really matter whether you're successful in the goal or not. And, and as if you are going on this quest and journey of self-improvement, discovery, commitment, it, you're going to draw so much benefit and it diffuses the pass-fail of the goal at the end of the day. And that's why we always focus on the journey so much and we focus on self-improvement rather than, look, it's great. Some athletes win world championships, athletes qualify to Hawaii. We celebrate all of that. Athletes cross the finish line of an Ironman. But the real benefit is how the journey fits in and amplifies life. And so I think that if, if we label me as fearless, which I push back on a little bit because I've got plenty of fear, but, or brave or whatever it is, I'm no more than anyone else. It's just that my journey is not trying to train for an Ironman. My tra journey is trying to help others and trying to build a business. That, that's what I do and, uh, and a whole bunch of other things that I try and be moderately good at, I guess. How do you assist your, so the journey, we totally agree, right? It's like, we can only live now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, our happiness is now, our, our contentment is now, our strength is now. It's, you know, it's, it's not from a time on the clock. It's, you know, happy, happiness is, is celebrated at the finish line, but, you know, it's short, it's short lived. Like we, our fullest potential, you know, to live and express life is right now. So how do you help guide athletes in either current athletes or athletes that you've had in the past if they're getting too caught up in that finish line and what that finish line's going to what they believe that finish line will bring them or the linear, you know, times and power and like the watts and the data and the information if you see them cuz the intellect loves to 
cling into these kinds of things. And if we cling too much, it's going to, I believe it limits us uh, into our potential and takes us away from the experience of the journey. Yeah, it's, uh, you're absolutely right. I, I, I concur. So I think that, I think it's important as a coach to bring your athletes along on the journey. And what I mean by that is uh, the, the backbone of everything that we do at Purple Patch is education. So I, I, I strongly believe that if you can empower an athlete, and, and I sometimes say, if I can make myself irrelevant, that's really good. In other words, if an athlete understands what, what the journey is going to be, why and how the journey is put together, uh, start to learn what smart decision making is and the big picture, then that's step number one. Step number two, we have a lot of cute educational sayings that can be little rallying calls for every type of athlete. So an example is nail the basics. And so there's a lot of noise out there. We talk about all the noise and all of the distraction and all of the data and all of the voodoo diets and everything else and say, these are the very basic things that you need to get. And, and we always talk about habits. Let's make these habits repeatable. And, and if you can get there, you're going to be 95% of the way there. So you've got education first so that you can empower. You've got habit-driven second and say, we'll cover off on all that complex and potentially useful stuff, et cetera, but let's get these first right. You know, let's, let's really have the building blocks right. And then continually rinse and repeat and endorse and reflect uh, with athletes as they are going along that journey. So, so that's number one. Number two, the, you, you, you asked at the start sort of getting too obsessed with the outcome or what the results might be. So, so I'll tell you a story that flashed into my, into my mind as soon as you said it. It was 2016. And the, the World Championships was in Maloolaba, Australia, the 70.3 World Championships. And I was coaching a, a young guy, Tim Reed, who's a wonderful guy. And uh, I used to call him Tim the Tinkerer because he was, uh, he was prone to what, paralysis of analysis. Mm. Really, you know, he would be and this wonderful guy, uh, one of my favorite athletes I've ever coached. In fact, the only athlete I've ever had that said, I want you to coach me, but I think I'm uncoachable. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't think, uh, and, and I had never heard, of it, never heard of him before outside of just, okay, he's Australian, he lives, and I'm in California. And I think he started with us in 2013 or so. And he said, I think you're the only guy that can coach me because I think I'm uncoachable. I, I tend to, I want a lot of autonomy. I want a lot of control, but I tend to overcomplicate things. And I might stray off plan. And so it was a, it was a, <laughs> so, do I? <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> yeah. Do I want to take this on? And, uh, and, and he, we ended up building this wonderful relationship and he's, he's an exceptional guy and he's incredibly smart. Now he's a very good coach himself. And, uh, but he did have a tendency to get over obsessive. So there might be a race and suddenly he'd wake up the the night of the race, and he'd say, oh, my, I think I remember research that latex tubes were slightly faster. So he'd go to his garage and almost maniacally start testing and then, then change his tube the race morning and then get a flat halfway through the race. And it was like, why did you do that? You know, it's, and it, it, so he had this tendency. And here we are at the 70.3 World Championships, which is the biggest race of the year for him. And it was really close to his hometown in Australia. So he had this tremendous weight of expectation. Oh my goodness me, it's my hometown, I've got to perform. Uh, yeah, Sebastian Keenley is the clear favorite, but there's the best field that's ever been assembled is at this race. And I've got all my friends watching, blah, blah, blah. You know, what's the, and it was very outcome in the discussions. And a week before the race, I had a conversation with him and he, 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 we wanted to have the strategy conversation. I said, here's your strategy, Tim. We can't predict what's going to happen on this race. 
It's like where you're going to come out of the swim, where you're going to come on the bike. The only things that we would like is, is to have options with two or three scenarios. What we do know is that if possible, we'd love to have the bike ride be very hard because that will maybe tenderize the really fast runners. And we want you to be up the front of that bike ride so that when you come off, you respond to uh, any action that's occurring really hard. And, and he said, okay, yeah, great, great. But it's in front of my hometown, blah, blah, blah. And, and we turned it around and I said, I completely trust your decision-making. So here's your, here's your race plan. Go and have fun. <laughs> that's your coach's race plan. And I said, but you have one opportunity in your life that you will ever in your life race a world championship in front of your friends in your hometown. One chance. Isn't that brilliant? And wouldn't it be a shame if you worried about the outcome and you don't just let it lift you and realize that this is a life opportunity? It comes back to me on the travel later and going through the airport trying to grab it. This is the, the chance. And the whole perception changed. He's like, I don't care what come happens. I'm just going to go and give it a crack. And I said, go and give it a crack. Have fun. A lot of depth in that. Make smart decisions all day. And it just so happened that every single decision that he made that day was the right one. A combination of a great athlete and a luck and, and luck. And he won the world championships. But he never would have won that if he had have had the weight of expectation and outcome. And so sometimes you can take things that is perceived as stressful and shift your relationship, acknowledge it, understand it, and shift your relationship with that thought or that worry and turn it into something that is an opportunity in many ways. Yeah, those thoughts, those thoughts can be so, whoa, they can be so derailing. Um, I can completely relate to going into the garage and trying to change tubes and do any <laughs> last minute fine tuning. And I see it in, in some of our athletes too. And it's that obsessive mind of maybe you forgot something and, and, and not being able to, to, rain in the thoughts, right? We're, we're having these thoughts constantly, right? I think it's like 70 or 80,000 thoughts a day. Um, which ones do you want to focus on? And you were that voice of reason in that, well, he was probably, well, was he pushing back at all? Did he push back at all when you said have fun? So the great thing about Tim is he's, he's very ironically coachable in the right uh, environment. And so after three buts and maybes, he, uh, he's, he's, he, he's a, a wonderful athlete and he just, he, he's, he's a thinker. So he's a tinkerer, but he's a thinker. And so it made sense and it was actionable. So he's like, that makes sense. Okay, I'll do that. And that's, I, I think some people get paralyzed. I'm not sure if I could have said, well, that makes sense. So therefore I, that's how I'm going to put my mind. And that, that's just a, a world-class athlete that can do that. But you don't have to be a world-class athlete to do that. You could be a very normal person, but, uh, but it doesn't mean it's easy. Mm. So getting back to uh, thoughts, Beach, before we yeah. hit record, Beach was talking about how um, your thought or your word of the week was thoughts. Um, so expand on that. Like, what did you, why was that your word of the week? What is it that you want people to inquire about with thoughts? Well, I think... Uh, what do you say, BJ? Seventy to eighty thousand thoughts a day. Is that right? <laughs> it's pretty, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> and I think sometimes I have about fifteen thousand of those in the middle of the night. But uh, that's why I keep a notepad next to the, my table. But I think f people get paralysed by emotions, by thoughts, and they can end up. There's feed forward or feedback. You can either be controlled by your thoughts, or you can actually pause, acknowledge the thought, and then decide how you're going to interact with it. And it, and it comes back to this whole theme that we've really focused on. If you have a purpose and direction, and, and you know what you're trying to achieve, the thoughts are normal. They're not to be suppressed. They're to be interacted with and, and accepted. But it's up to you, ultimately, 
whether you let them pull you off your purpose, off your track, off your direction. And if you shift your relationship with all of the natural emotions and thoughts, I think a lot of people, a lot of athletes and, and everyday people try and suppress having the thoughts, try and mm -hmm. push them down, try and ignore them and, uh, and think that it's, you know, tough man, bravery, no, I'm, I'm not scared. And he said, it's like, actually, no, it's there, it's true, but I'm going to actually not let that influence what I'm focusing on right now. Whatever it is, whatever the project is, the task is, the, the goal is, the race is. And um, so I think that was the essence of really what I was talking about, of, uh, of accepting it. I think that when it starts to go on to like pre-race anxiety or the stress of the situation of COVID, you know, all of these things, people think it's important to put a brave front on and pretend they're not stressed or nervous about an upcoming race. So no, <laughs> I'm nervous about a race because I want it because it means something to me. It's important, but that's normal. That's if you're not nervous about a race, you're not going to perform well. So that's normal. And uh, yeah, everyone lining up in the um, for the pool to lose uh, at the first you know race morning, no one's going to struggle to go to the bathroom. I promise you that. And uh, it's because we're nervous. Welcome, you know, the world champion that wins that year. They didn't struggle to go to the bathroom in the morning. I promise you that much. <laughs> Um, you talked about stress, and I think this is a good segue, you know, anxiety and all of that. Do you have, I, personally, I want to know, do you have like, um, I know you also work with some high-level executives, um, and we know that, um, you know, the most successful people always have some kind of morning routine, and I'm wondering if you personally have one that you would be willing to share. I, I would. Uh... <laughs> I'll tell you my morning routine because uh, <laughs> Kelly uh, Kelly always makes fun fun of me. Uh, so I I tend to be a morning lark. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, morning lark rather than a night owl. So uh, uh, I, I get up pretty early. Always sort of naturally have. And th there is one thing I'm going to tell you, but I'll, I'll first tell you my actual actions, which is always exactly the same, which is. First of all, I, I like very high quality coffee and I like no one to speak to me for 15 minutes or so. And so there is nothing I like more than the last thing I'm going to do when I first wake up is look at email or anything like that. But I'm a citizen of the world, so I make a cup of coffee and I like to sit down. I like to read the paper and uh, and, and I just... Don't think about anything. I, I just read the paper, see what's going on, and I enjoy my coffee. And I, I imagine that I am sitting outside in a nice cafe in Paris or somewhere, but in fact, I'm just at my kitchen counter. Uh, but from a, from a performance standpoint, when I think about what I really encourage my, my executives to do, what I really encourage my athletes to do, and, and this stems out of, you mentioned earlier, all of the data and a lot of people are wearing their bands or their rings or they're looking at their scores or their resting heart rate or anything. I think the most important thing that you can do somewhere over the first 15 or 20 minutes or even when you're lying down and you don't get out of bed is ask yourself a simple question. How am I doing today? How do I feel? And I just have a little pause, a little point of reflection and how am I doing today? Now, from an athlete standpoint, that can be your framework that you add into your decision matrix around, is this a day that I'm going to go and do a hard workout or is it a day that I need to look at things in a different way, whatever it might be. But I think it's just having a little bit of self-awareness to start the day is always really beneficial. Um, it, whatever the answer is to that question, I always have a second cup of coffee and then I'm ready to start my day. But uh, <laughs> that, that's my ritual. And, and I, I like a, a lot of the very busy executives I work with, CEOs that have very busy lives, if we can have 
a little bit of time before they just jump on the bike or go running to do that and look at their schedule of the day. I think if you're grounded and you're saying, these are the things that are my commitments, and I always go in this order, my, my life commitments, my work commitments for those men and women, it's meetings and everything else, what I need to get accomplished, then um, uh, sort of lifestyle commitments, that's for any free time you have, any time, and then what's my training at the back end of this? Because it's always an integration into life approach with training. That's the thing that's an optimization. We don't start with that and then try and work out life around it. So, so that's a habit that I like uh, very busy people to do is to get a little bit of a landscape of the, the day that they've got. And that is a, a, a very quick habit that comes out of something that we universally have, which you might have heard me talk about before the Sunday special. I, uh, that started with our pro athletes, but, uh, but very quickly went on to our executives where every Sunday we encourage, whether it's an athlete, whether it's just a lifestyle enthusiast to spend 15 or 20 minutes every Sunday to plot their week ahead and, and move into Monday in execution mode. Where's my key training sessions? Where are my big meetings? Where have I got to be to coach Johnny in soccer or whatever it might be? And that very simple habit of a pause, look back on the last week and come up for perspective and look ahead is so blindingly simple. I almost feel silly bringing it up, but most people don't do it. And it is the biggest opportunity for someone to feel like they're in control. And if you're in control, you're executing, you're not reacting. It doesn't matter whether you're an athlete. It doesn't matter whether you're a busy parent. It doesn't matter whether you're a CEO. If you can have control and say, that's what I'm going to do, it calms everything down. Because you get busy doing it rather than going, oh, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. Oh, I say, you. And just living in chaos the whole time. It's the tent peg that within the chaos enables you to have stability. Yeah. And, and when we get, oh, you know, it's really like an overwhelm, right? We, we feel like we're not in control of, of what's happening and everything that we, that we need to do in a day. And I've experienced this, you know, like my eyelids aren't even open yet and I'm already at 10 o'clock at night and I'm exhausted, you know, and, and that's, I think, an example of somebody who felt out of control. And it's a very powerless place to be. It feels very powerless. It doesn't feel like you have any power. So when you can get out ahead of it a bit and look at those key things that you need to do, you can move in in a powerful way to execute. One of the things that you are um, a leader in is the time-starved athlete. So how do you work with people? Like, what is a time-starved athlete as far as, like, let's get take an example of perhaps, unless you have a better one, perhaps somebody who's looking to do their first Ironman. What would a time-starved athlete look like? Like, how much time would that be? So there's always, I, I remember I was doing a talk to a large triathlon club who I won't mention, and I... Uh, I asked them, I started the talk with a question, how many hours does it take to train for an Ironman? And, you know, across the room, there are a couple of hundred people in the room and they mostly said, oh, 20, 25, 18. And the average was about 20 hours a week. So my follow-up question was, who has 20 hours a week to train? And about three people put their hands up. <laughs> I was like, so you're all failures, yeah? You can't, you can't get ready for the goals that you're doing. And, and the reason I start with that story is that the answer of how many hours is necessary to train to get ready for your events is it depends. Because it depends on the rest of your life. Because what we're playing with is stress management. We are all managing this thing called life that provides us with a whole bunch of different stresses. Work, self-stress, financial stress, environmental stress, travel when we could travel, everything, and it all accumulates. And what we are looking to do as an athlete that's going on a journey in our case study to train for an Ironman is to integrate a specific stress training into that big bucket of stress and enable us to achieve positive adaptations, get fitter, stronger, more powerful, etc. So for an athlete that is time-starved, what we do is we first look at the fabric of their life 
and uh, what are all of their commitments, work, family, everything else. Then we put aside appropriate time to step away and have a little self time. And that could be meditation. It could be building model airplanes. It could be being out with friends and family, but you've got to have other elements of your life that are really important. We then block out enough sleep because training won't be effective if you don't restore and recover because that's where the adaptations have. And then what you've got left over once you go through this pretty simple but exhaustive process is a block of time. And it could be eight hours, it could be 12 hours, it could be 16 hours. But that is then the time that you have to train for your event. And because the magic word is consistency, you want to, to get ready for an Ironman, it's many, many weeks, many, many months. It's not just what you can do in one week, it's what you can do over, in sometimes multiple years even. You have to create sustainability. And so let's just say it's 12 hours a week. I then, as a, as a coach or the athlete, has an optimization challenge. What's my best return on investment for these 12 hours that I have? And then the one final thing on top of that is it's life is not a spreadsheet. So we're not building a bridge, okay? It's the human body that is responding the whole time. And life is breathing. Sometimes life is going to ebb, sometimes it's going to flow. And so you have to, we really encourage athletes to have a dynamic mindset. Give or take, you're going to train 10 hours or 12 hours a week. But sometimes you might have extra commitments with work. You might have a really busy time with the family. And so you might only do eight hours, but let's make sure they're really effective. And let's come up a big level and say, over the course of many months, that's good. That's a smart decision. Other time, the family might go away and you might be solo and you might be able to do 16 hours and let's take advantage. And so by having that plasticity, that dynamic mindset, then you layer on consistency, you avoid deep emotional fatigue and burnout and the mental cognitive costs that training can, can, uh, can, can do that, develop. You have a better chance of staying healthy and ultimately when you add up all the training hours over the course of many months, if they're effective, that's the thing that's going to get you ready to achieve your goals. That's not sexy, Matt. <laughs> it's not sexy. It's not a quick fix. But you know what? You know what's sexy is. Uh, you know what is sexy though. Joking aside, feeling energetic mm -hmm. by going on this journey, actually having improved health, being able to show up for your friends and family and be present, being more effective in the workplace. That's, and by the way, having the joy of finishing an Ironman. And, and I think it's achievable to have all of those things. And you've got too many people walking around in the fog of fatigue because they start with, I've got to do 20 hours a week. They go about ramming it into life and something has to give. And it's quite often their relationship, their happiness, their health, their ability to perform in the workplace. And it's just not necessary. It's, uh, it's really not. I feel there's a rationale um, that you can bury a lot of things in just volume. You know, you can mm -hmm. 20, 30 hours a week, as long as you do that, you'll be fine for the Ironman. But what happens within that time really is not specific. And, and so when you hone in that skill, what you're talking about, you're getting very specific in 10 hours and making it really efficient. Um, well, at least maybe in my mind, it's like you can also get lost in doing the high volume. And I know you as a swimmer, swimming background, I'm sure you know know that like follow that black line for day, for hours and hours twice a day, maybe three times a day and, and really putting your 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 nose to the grindstone and like getting that getting that work in. But this approach of less is more. You know, less is more. The the happiness factor, the joy factor, the sexy factor of your of your entire life is much more important. But somehow we got lost in the in the volume of things, and maybe maybe this time that we just had a year away from any specific you know racing on the calendar has allowed us to maybe explore that option a little bit more. We were forced to be alone. We were forced to be in our home. We were forced to be with our thoughts. So I guess my question is like discerning um, how you bury yourself with volume and how you can sort of switch that over to maybe just 
allowing yourself to, to be a little bit more gentle on yourself. Yeah, it, I, I want to address one thing because less is more is a saying that sounds empowering but sometimes is uh, uh, misconstrued. Because if less was truly more, and then my professional athletes would only do 12 hours a week, but they don't, they do 25, okay, or whatever. I don't actually count how many hours they do. That's one way to not worry about accumulating hours. Don't count them, okay? That's, <laughs> I've never, you, t you asked me how many hours Sam Appleton trains. I don't know, it's rough, but let's call it 25, okay? But they're doing a lot of work. So I always talk about the, doing the right hours in the context of your life. And, uh, you know, the last amateur, our last th three out of the last four amateurs that won the Hawaii Ironman in their age group, and we're, we've, we've had a lot of good age groupers that have, you know, that's the winning their age group at the World Championships, and three out of four of them have been CEOs. That's pretty crazy. And, but th I think that the, the lesson on that is, I'll use one as an example who's very well known in the in the tech world, a guy called Sami Inkinen. And he went under nine hours at the Hawaii Ironman, which is very, very fast. And he never trained more than 10 hours a week, which is completely crazy. Now, he's genetically gifted. And it's not the, the lesson of his of that is not that that's why he's called Sami the bull, by the way, because he's got lungs like a bull. But it's not that 10 hours is what anyone needs to become world champion. It's that if I had have prescribed 16 hours, at the same time that he had a family and was building a tech company, it would have been too much and he wouldn't have performed as well. And so it's hours within context. The, your, your point of this last year is spot on because out of the adversity of being stuck at home and life changing and the stress and, and the fear that we've all had of everything that's happening, it's humans are adaptable and, and we've all kind of quote, kind of got used to it and we haven't had a chance to race. But I think that it's, it has in many ways for many people strip things down to the very basic element. And it's almost a, a chance for a little bit of a reset and a, and a regrounding in a way of what's important. And as we go through the back end of this year and events come back and going into 2022, I think that we're gonna see people with renewed vigor, great enthusiasm, a different lens on the, the value and role of sport into their life and where it fits. And I hope that we see I, I, I've said this a lot, it's a great opportunity to have an amazing year of performance on the back end of this year, like from a, from a splits or doing your best or finishing your first or whatever. But there's also a great chance to draw the lessons and be grounded and reset how you approach the sport. Because there are a lot of people that are going through a sporting journey almost with a monkey on the back, almost like it's purgatory. And I think now we've got a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of people that are like, I actually really enjoy this and I, I really want to enjoy it. And, and maybe there's a resetting of values around the sport, which I think is an opportunity. And I think people are gonna go very, very fast. Yeah, we had, um, <laughs> we had Paula um, on the podcast right after Daytona, Paula Finley, and they didn't, she didn't race all year, just trained because she loved to train. She's in love. She has a dog <laughs> and she shows up on one day, the one day that they're given to race and just throws it down and has an amazing experience. And, you know, there's something to that. There's something about not beating, beating your body down time after time. There's, there's also something to getting familiar and consistent with um, the experience mm -hmm. of those distances. But in that element, I think it's a testament to what happened last year and then show up and just perform based on the joy of what you're doing in life. Mm -hmm. You know what, in Daytona we had, we had Sam Appleton racing and uh, it really reminds me, her, Paula's story, she had a wonderful day and a, and a great performance and great to see her journey. You talk about someone that's gone through adversity. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't listened to your guys' conversation yet, but I certainly will because there's an athlete that's gone through a good amount of adversity mm -hmm. and it's great to see her shine. But uh, 
But Sam was similar. He hadn't raced all year. And in race week, he had a great race there. He had a really good race. But what we said in race week is, Sam, I have absolutely no idea how you're going to race. I, I, don't, I know that you're in really good form. I know that you've trained really well, but you haven't raced for a year. And so rather than that shackling you and being a cause of stress, let that be a release and say, look, we don't know, but I think there's an important thing. No expectations is not the same thing as low expectations. And that's really important. So with Paula, where she absolutely raced great, but hadn't raced for a year, just trained through, showed up and said, let's let it be a release. Let's go and give it a crack. And it was wonderful to see her do well. Same thing with Sam Appleton. Had a great day because it's okay not to know, but then you can just ask your body the question, what are you going to give me today? And if you go in with no expectations, it can be the, the best release ever. And then you can actually have this thing in racing, which is quite marvelous, which is fun. And when you have that, typically the body responds. And so, uh, so yeah, I think that was, um, that was the lesson, really. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think those two things get confused. I've never heard anybody, you know, make that discernment. I think that's a really important takeaway. Uh, thank you so much for your time today, Matt. Uh, I know we had been in touch, you know, gosh, pre-COVID, long, long all of time. that uh, yeah. to get together. <laughs> and we made that happen today. And timing, we, we always trust that timing is perfect. And I think this is going to be a great uh, conversation to get people, you know, kicked off for the season as we do see races coming back. So if people want um, more of your knowledge that you share because i mean i think your podcast is amazing we've we've received a lot of education from it but can you just let the listeners know where they can get more of you sure well the the podcast is purple patch podcast it's um it's all anchored around performance it's all educational with a little bit of my irreverence and stupidity tied in there as well of course uh so you, you have to get used to listening to a britishman be what he thinks is funny, but maybe is not so funny sometimes. <laughs> and um, and then on socials, uh, we have um, uh, at Purple Patch on Twitter and at Purple Patch Fitness on Instagram. But of course, the website, we, we do a lot of free education. I think the best thing for people to do is get on our newsletter, to be honest. Just head to purplepatchfitness.com. We are, we are actually, over the course of 2021, putting a heavy emphasis on giving away as much education as we possibly can. And, uh, and it's around the whole sphere of performance. So head to the website, sign up for that. We're not going to try and sell you anything. We're going to uh, try and help, basically. So, But I, I will say, guys, thank you so much. I, I really love the conversation. It was really refreshing and, uh, and enjoyable. And, and hopefully uh, my ramblings were a little helpful very helpful absolutely thanks so much matt thank you